What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. The first step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Justin Adams. Uh, I uh, co-lead our nature-based solutions work at the World Economic Forum. It's my great delight to be leading this issue briefing uh, this afternoon about unlocking carbon markets. Uh, and carbon markets right now are really hot. There isn't a week that goes by without new announcements from corporates, from governments, and stories that are in the press. But it's also no exaggeration to say that there are few more polarizing and contentious topics in the environment movement right now than carbon markets. So a couple of quick thoughts to set the scene. We've seen this dramatic increase in corporate interest, corporate investment. Uh, Ecosystem Marketplace published a report just last week highlighting that the voluntary market, so corporate investment, has uh, reached almost three quarters of a billion dollars, and they expect it to top a billion dollars in the, in the year ahead. Back in January, uh, we at the Davos Agenda Week hosted Mark Carney's launch of the task force for scaling these voluntary carbon markets. And just this week, just a couple of days ago, they've announced a stellar new advisory board. Carbon markets are also a perennial flashpoint in the formal UN negotiations due to kick off in a, uh, well, the next round to kick off again in a few weeks in Glasgow. Uh, but many activists fear that governments will try to dilute ambition by using carbon markets and the provisions of what's called Article 6 in the Paris Agreement to try and reduce overall ambition. So there's lots of buzzwords, and I'm sure we'll touch on a few of them, but I just want to drill it down to, in essence, what carbon markets are, for those of you who may be looking at this issue uh, for the first time. And at the simplest level, Carbon markets are where if you have overcommitted or overachieved, rather overachieved on your climate commitments, you can sell uh, excess carbon credits to somebody, another entity, a polluting entity or a country that is looking to try uh, and uh, increase their own ambition, but not able to decarbonize quickly enough. Uh, we've got existing regulated markets in places like Europe with the European Emission Trading Scheme in California and these voluntary markets that we've already said uh, that corporates are investing into. So the theory has always been that done right, these markets could actually lower the overall cost 
of achieving our climate ambition without diluting any of that ambition that we know is needed. So done right, we also know, and you'll hear from one of the panelists in particular today, that, 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 that they could also be a crucial source of finance for critical issues like how do we stop deforestation by providing crucial incentives, crucial financial incentives for countries with tropical forests for how the forest can be more valuable standing rather than a today where we see more value when it's clear for agricultural production. So in theory, they can be a really great thing. But the challenge for the last 20 years, they have not fully delivered on the promise that they've always held out. And too often, uh, there's both perception and reality that, that real reductions have not resulted from the use of these carbon markets and that they can be susceptible to greenwashing claims. So we've got a stellar panel now. And what we're going to do is unpack some of this to really think about what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what might we be able to hold on to as we go forward. So the three panelists, I'm delighted we've got Rachel Kite, the Dean of the Fletcher School uh, from uh, Tufts University in, in the US, uh, Joaquim Levy, the Director of Economic Strategy and Market Relations from Banco Safra in Brazil, and Erin Bloomgarten, the Executive Director of Emergent. But all three of them have also got incredibly rich backgrounds and past. Joaquim is former uh, uh, CFO from the World Bank, former Minister of Finance and the President of the Brazilian Development Bank, Rachel heading up climate at the World Bank for many, many years, and Erin been involved in private markets for carbon. So great, great panel. I'm going to turn to you first, Rachel. Carbon markets, a crucial part of the solution or a dangerous distraction? And I'll turn to each uh, of you with that same question. <laughs> crucial part of the solution. And I think this race to zero that has really just exploded uh, over the last uh, 12 or 18 months with corporate commitments coming in stronger and stronger around net zero have brought real attention to the market in, in a way that we hadn't really seen before. Um, I'm now the co-chair of the Voluntary Carbon Markets Initiative. And, and that's because the only, the only way in which the carbon markets, voluntary and regulated, uh, are a crucial part of the future is if they actually achieve the end purpose, which is to put us on a pathway to 1.5, to smooth the pathway to 1.5 degrees, and that they provide a sort of, uh, that they are global and liquid, and they uh, provide a, a source of revenue to uh, the protection of the natural resources that we need into countries who are faced with extraordinary dilemmas in how to adapt and um, uh, and become resilient. So voluntary carbon markets, carbon markets, only a part of the solution if they actually help us achieve those goals. So they, they have to have this purpose, which means that we need to have high integrity carbon markets. And I think that's where the, the drama and the disagreement uh, lies. There is a complexity to, the, to building these markets and they have to be high integrity, which means that a claim made by a company has to have credibility, has to be transparent, has to be assured and verified. And the actual uh, performance of a country or or of, a, of an asset which could be then traded also has to be uh, has to have integrity so the voluntary carbon markets initiative is sort of established to you know with this ethic of an end-to-end -end, uh, approach to integrity across the markets really what we're looking at doing is trying to uh, through a multi-stakeholder process try to make sure that developing countries have access to these markets because without that credibility is difficult and that the claims that are made by companies uh, are ones which are, have integrity and can be verified. So we're going to be doing sort of the dirty skunk works uh, that has to happen within any market when you build it up. So looking at the scope and purposes of claims, looking at transparency and accounting, and we're going to be coming forward and putting forward uh, sort of straw men or women for, for market participants to tear down. There's extraordinary innovation in the market, both on the uh, on the supply side and uh, obviously Aaron's going to talk about LEAF. I think there's also extraordinary potential for transparency using new data, uh, big data technologies using uh, blockchain, using uh, other ways to be transparent. So I think there's a huge potential to make this work for those twin goals of one and a half degrees and global participation. Uh, but we're right. going to have to hold ourselves to account in order to be able to do that. Very good. So, I mean, you talked about complexity, you then talked clearly about integrity, uh, and obviously the path to one and a half degrees being crucial, but your answer, carbon markets are a crucial part of the solution, we're just going to have to get it right. 
So uh, Aaron, let me turn to you. Crucial part of the solution or dangerous distraction? Uh, yeah, in my mind, absolutely crucial part of the solution, Justin. Um, you know, I've been part of, I've been involved in carbon markets for the, almost the last 20 years. Uh, and I think they're, they, they are, uh, if done right, as Rachel's suggesting, they, uh, they are a crucial and need to be a crucial part of the, part of the solution. And so just looking at both, Rachel had mentioned the supply and, and demand side. And so just looking at both of those, you know, what I'm really interested in is how do we protect nature? How do we protect standing nature and ecosystems? And when you think about how you can do that, ultimately, you know, we're living in an uh, economic system that we have uh, and people make decisions, government make, make decisions based on incentives. So to keep ecosystems in place, to keep forests standing, we need, to, we need to find ways to change the economics on the ground to give them some value, um, non-extractive value. And one of the best ways to do that, uh, having thought about this over the last 20 years, in my view at least, is to pay for, an eco for ecosystem services coming out of those forests. There's water, there's biodiversity, but the one that's the biggest and that people are frankly globally willing to pay for is carbon. And so in my view, one of the best hopes of keeping nature standing, keeping ecosystems intact and forest, is, forest standing is uh, through uh, payments for, for, from voluntary carbon markets. Then on the demand side, and that's also crucial, um, you know, and this is where, you know, some of the criticism in Levy that uh, companies are, uh, are, are delaying action or not. Uh, we need to hold companies account. There's no doubt. Companies and buyers of, of, of carbon credits need to do, be doing everything they can within their own operations and within their own value chain. But let's face it, there are some companies and some sectors that just don't have an alternative. Unless, and so unless we're all happy to stop flying, right? we have to hold those companies to account. And I think you'll find if, that the companies that are participating in voluntary carbon markets and purchasing carbon offsets, they're actually embedding a carbon price in, into their operations. We can't just let them off. We've got to say the, the uh, emissions that you can't mitigate You've got to cover one way or another, and offsets, and, and you know, in my view, are probably one of the best ways. Uh, one of the best ways to do that. Very good. So, thank you, Aaron. So, so you, again, talking very clearly there about using carbon finance or payment for ecosystem services to help conserve forests, a crucial source of finance. But this importance of getting the integrity of that right, both on the supply side. So, what projects are we actually doing in the in the tropics and other forests ecosystems? around the world and we'll come back here more about that and then similarly for, for the corporates how do we ensure claims that they're making actually a part of their overall climate plan and not just some corporate greenwash uh, and i think we've got a good examples of, of of where they where they are doing that but there are also examples where they're not doing that so joaquim uh you i mean so much experience in this space you've written about it uh and in brazil Right. Is this a key part of the solution? Is this something that we should be really sort of piling in on and, and helping Brazil bring this forward? Or is this a dangerous distraction in the Brazilian context? No, this is very central uh, to Brazil and I think to many, many other countries uh, for two reasons. First, because it's a very important way to, to bring, uh, say, the, the South in, in the discussion and uh, right. opening uh, economic opportunities. Uh, in this fight to, to net zero. Uh, the second, which is related to that, is that in many cases, we don't have uh, technologies yet. Uh, I don't think that by having uh, uh, carbon offsets, uh, carbon credits, uh, and supporting nature-based solutions that uh, exist today, we are hindering the development of new technologies uh, that we all look for. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we have a number of ways to reduce emissions today and in an inclusive way, not only in terms of countries, but also of populations within countries. And the uh, uh, carbon credits can have a huge impact on that. Um, now, uh, Responding to, to, to supply, two things. First, integrity uh, uh, and, uh, and transparency is fundamental. Uh, second, you have to think about what kind of activities 
uh, should be eligible. And I think that uh, in addition to just conservation, which is very important because of all the service that Aaron has mentioned, also things that change the economics, especially in the agriculture sector, are very important. So anything that creates incentive, for instance, to have a, a low emission uh, agriculture or to change uh, the dynamics in uh, meat production, uh, all of these things, uh, uh, there are ways to stimulate uh, new, new ways of doing things, for instance, intensifying uh, uh, cattle raising that to free lands to reforestation. These are good things that should be recognized. We need to have, uh, say, a clear uh, guidelines and, uh, and a framework to, uh, to work with that. Also because one thing that I learned, now looking at the demand, uh, one thing that I learned when I was issuing papers that uh, uh, from the World Bank or from Brazil is that corporations need things that are simple to understand, that are liquid, that uh, our people can recognize. So the same way that uh, when you issue a simple debt, or even if it's a green bond or uh, uh, say result linked bond, these things have to be uh, easy to understand, verifiable, so that uh, uh, you really get a market and people can price it. So I think we have to continue to work on both sides and the supply and demand, but we know broadly, uh, what you have to do. Increase the range of, uh, of activities that can be covered, uh, integrated these in the voluntary and mandatory market, and have this sort of standardization where you can uh, uh, really identify uh, what a project that is, uh, say, underlying um, a credit or whatever security uh, is really bringing to our final goal, which is net zero. Terrific. And the one and a half degree pathway that Rachel talked to. So, so I mean, again, great examples, examples of kind of how you can use it to incentivize you know, different sectors of the economy in that transition uh, that we know is needed to, uh, to net zero and to one and a half degrees. But I want to turn now to each of you again with the same question. You know, it, there's such a great idea. Why have they why have we not seen more progress in the last 20 years? Uh, and what do we need to think about differently as we as this new wave of money comes in, as the new interest comes in, if we're going to avoid some of the mistakes that, that, that we've seen in the past? Rachel. Well, I, I think that <clears throat> well, I think we need we need we'd need more than 30 minutes to discuss all the things that haven't happened over the last 20 years that could have happened and perhaps should have happened. But I think where we stand now is that we have huge distrust uh, because. Um, you haven't seen the flow of finance uh, and support and resources into the communities. You haven't seen the slowing down of the rate of destruction uh, of forest and nature. And you've seen some outrageous and egregious greenwashing and outrageous and egregious claims and some really quite, you know, absurd um, credits that, and so absurd that my dog agrees with me. So the issue is really now, how do we build credibility? And so we have to call out the greenwashing uh, and we have to recognize on the demand side that there is only a business case for a voluntary carbon market if it is high integrity. If it's not high integrity, then we don't actually have a voluntary carbon market that helps and it won't help anybody. And then we have to assure access by developing countries into this carbon market so that it can provide the kind of financial flow. So I think we have to and I think this is why the work that I'm doing, the work that uh, the task force, which uh, has got its new governance in place now is so important, is that we actually have to form greater and greater agreement about the rules that we will operate within and how we will be transparent. So I think those are part of the reasons why it hasn't worked up to now. And that's what we need in for order for it to work uh, going forward. And I'm going to mute now. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Aaron, let me come to you to build on that exactly the same question. Great, so I love this question. Um, I would actually, maybe I'll be a bit of a contrarian here and say, I actually think that uh, in many ways, carbon markets over the last 20 years have been a huge success. Uh, they lowered the cost tremendously of uh, you know, implementation and smoothed the transition of implementation of the EU ETS. Uh, China, which was a great beneficiary, was, uh, you know, was frankly brought to the table in a much more meaningful way. We, uh, because they were recipient of CDM finance, 
Uh, and so, so we may not have seen the type of action we're seeing at the national level now with the carbon market in China. I could go on and on. I mean, I think yes, there there have been problems, but you know, this you know, there was a frankly a learning by 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 doing phase. In terms of also, I mean, I, I also think um, a few things. I think first of all, uh, we do need to say on the greenwashing side. I think that Rachel raised. We do need to see uh, uh, more rigorous standards uh, on buyer uh, criteria. We've tried to implement that through Leaf. I would talk more about, but uh, and then on the on the supply side. Um, you know, I've spent uh, the last 20 years investing in developing probably about 30 uh, carbon projects. And there's some great projects with great impacts. Uh, two things. One is there've been a lot of great projects. There've been a few bad projects. And so there's a bit of a bad apple uh, thing that kind of tarnishes the whole, the, whole, the whole thing. My personal view is, you know, we're in such an emergency, climate emergency right now that it's time to think beyond projects, not abandoned projects. We still need projects. But we need much. We need to move much faster and much larger scale. And way way to do that, in my view, and this is the focus of Leaf and Emergent, is at the jurisdictional approach. Again, not abandoning projects. We got to do both. But we need to mobilize and and, and connect carbon markets to uh, this jurisdictional action as a, a way to aggregate right. and get to scale. Very good. So we'll come back to that in the final round in a moment. But uh, Joachim, you know, your thoughts on the progress. Uh, and or lack of progress, uh, different views from Rachel and Aaron there in the last 20 years. Oh, look, I think the dynamics of, uh, of uh, carbon and decarbonization has changed dramatically in the last uh, three or four years, uh, since 2015. Um, so you cannot compare what happened, say, in the few years after Kyoto, uh, where actually, as Aaron said, there was a lot of, of things happening, but with a learning process with low demand, with a new level of commitment of corporations, including corporations in countries that don't have, um, say, regulated carbon markets. So if you were an American company, how you deal with the environment? There is no, no framework for you, so you try your best. And I think LEAF is an example of, of people trying to, to band together to, to have something meaningful. And I would have a word uh, on the so-called jurisdictional uh, uh, approach, which is, I mean, trust local governments in doing that. And uh, what is the advantage is that uh, um, project preparation is, is a real problem. It it's, it's, uh, takes time and so on. So if you don't have some sort of a framework, sometimes provided by the local government, it's very difficult to, to have these. And then you, yeah, you may even have incentives for a sort of a lower integrity projects and so on, if things are done in a very unstructured way. So I think that we, with increasing demand, with the sense that this will be something that uh, has a time of horizon, so it's not something that happens today, a flash and you disappear, you will start to get in place uh, what are the typical things needed to uh, build a market, to build an industry, which is a sort of, uh, say, uh, uh, f be able to foresee the future, uh, uh, to have some sort of framework where you can build. So also the responsibilities of the different actors are more well specified. And there are very encouraging uh, examples of these uh, happening, but the surly, we, we need to accelerate that. Very good. So we're going to go into a final round now, right? I think really fascinating what you've each outline there that, that actually there's been a lot of learning the last 20 years. There's been some real progress, but we've also sort of fallen short in a number of areas. You talked about the trust issue, Rachel, uh, and clearly the integrity issue sort of runs throughout this. You know, as we head now to Glasgow, we've got five minutes to sort of you know, try and bring this together. What are the things that, that are happening? And Aaron, you've talked about LEAF, and, but, but you've each got examples of where there are signs of hope of how we're gonna to get to scale and how we're actually gonna ensure the promise of carbon markets can finally deliver at the scale and the urgency of action that's so desperately needed uh, given all the science. So, so Rachel, to you first. Yeah, so I think that there's there's been important work done this year uh, and that the UK uh, presidency has been spurring. They will be the presidents for the year following on. I mean, you know, the presidency is assumed just before the COP, right? So I think that Alok Sharma will look to continue to drive towards um, smooth operating, a high integrity, voluntary carbon markets that then can scale. 
And so I think that uh, there's progress being made by the task force. BCMI will be offering uh, in the in the weeks after COP26 uh, uh, different guardrails and ways to think about uh, integrity, and that we can start to sort of gather uh, some critical mass around high performance. I think what you should see before um, before COP26 is obviously continuing commitments by companies in a race to net zero but i think that those companies that understand that um that the high integrity is the absolute sine qua non of a functioning voluntary carbon market for the goals of cop 26 i think you'll start to see companies coming out saying we understand that uh, we have to be transparent and we have to meet the highest standards so you know a, a claim in a voluntary carbon market has to come after a company can show how it's going to manage its transition and that the voluntary carbon market is not just sort of laundering sort of carbon around, but we are actually in the, in the process of trying to reduce emissions to meet 1.5. So I think you're going to see lots more announcements. You're also going to see, I think, uh, pledges by, uh, by developing countries to, to get their houses in order and to, to build the mechanisms that they need in order to be able to participate. Uh, UNDP will be doing a lot of work in that respect. So uh, we're on a very tight time track, but I think there'll be things coming into view before COP26, but then after COP26, the voluntary carbon markets become a very big uh, on, on ramp. For some, for some, hopefully, a successful Article 6 negotiation in, in Glasgow means that this is an on ramp to regulated markets. Um, but if the regulation is still uh, out into the future, then voluntary carbon markets have got a role to play. And people like uh, Emergence and Leaf are very, very important. Great. So thank you. So Aaron, go, let's go straight to you. We're running a little tight on time. Uh, Emergent, Leaf, how are you playing your part? What are you seeing in the run up to Glasgow? Yeah. And, and so, I, you know, one of the things, one of the signs of hope, I think, and, and at Emergent, we're speaking to corporates, CSOs and uh, every day. And I think one of the things that we that that uh, it, it is a sign of hope is that these corporates are really moving now. Uh, is much different than it was two years ago. There's a lot of pressure on companies to act. They're starting to really build it into their core businesses, uh, really understand what this means and, and think deeply about how they engage in this. In terms of emergent uh, and LEAF, um, we have, you know, we, we launched LEAF uh, in April at the uh, White House uh, Climate Summit. We uh, announced a target of uh, a billion dollars, so 100 million tons at $10 per ton. So you'll you'll let you know hear uh, progress uh, about how, you know where we are towards that. But I would say um, beyond that, look, we know that leaf the billion dollars is way too small. I mean, it sounds like a lot. It's a headline, uh, but this needs to be much much bigger with 10x, 20x, and so. Um, you know, we and, and LEAF is really a platform for collective action, public, private, civil society uh, action. And so, uh, you know, additional partnerships, um, you know, other additional companies coming on uh, and, and certainly now uh, starting to, you know, uh, highlight some of the jurisdictions that we're that we're talking to. So that's what's coming for us. Terrific. And it's great to see you yesterday, you know, Boeing, PwC joining you and then yeah, hopefully these announcements of real partnerships with states and provinces in the critical forest countries as well. So terrific. Uh, Joachim, uh, uh, last thoughts from you in terms of what are we looking forward to? What gives you hope? Okay, well, I, I have hope because we're seeing a lot of activities, uh, including from the financial sector. I mean, banks, uh, as well as uh, asset managers, etc. They're putting together um, funds and other instruments so that you can channel uh, a capital uh, to to forest areas and also for those activities that I mentioned that can uh, reduce emissions or even capture. Uh, emissions efficient ways. And we are working in many cases together with institutions like TNC, uh, WRI, and we could have a, a number of very good examples of things that uh, have on their own already some, uh, um, say, scale, but are also pilots of things that uh, could really become, uh, uh, um, say, standards uh, for, for, uh, for these type of activities. Now, I would say that in addition to that, we have to integrate voluntary and uh, uh, regulated uh, uh, carbon markets because otherwise pretty soon we're going to start to have uh, questions about say a company does uh, something and where it would come to uh, would be in the headquarter country of the company or you'll be in the place that uh, uh, these are uh, are happening and so on and so forth in this uh, aspect i think that the discussion 
of companies uh, having dialogues with subnational governments sometimes can be very helpful for the reason I mentioned. Uh, if, uh, governments can provide frameworks, can provide an environment where a lot more things can happen in, um, say, more transparent uh, and more monitored uh, way. So, a lot of things to do, very but uh, I think the last 18 months we made a lot of progress too. Very, very good. So, um, I want to thank all the panelists for a really engaging discussion. I think we could have probably gone double the time uh, and still not touched all the issues, but uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of the opportunity to unlock carbon markets. Certainly challenges ahead, but I think unanimity from this group that carbon markets will play a crucial role. Lots of lessons we can learn from the last 20 years uh, of what's gone well, what's gone less well. And then as we move forward, some of the things we're hearing about the innovation that's there, the financial sector getting involved, the partnerships that are going to be crucial, public-private to actually make this work, the relationship between the voluntary market and where so many corporates are piling in, but then the necessity of regulatory markets as well. And then the crucial, crucial piece of the rule-based system to ensure that there is integrity and the great work that the VCMI is doing, that uh, Rachel is now co-chairing, the great work on integrity that LEAF is doing, uh, working with the forest countries to ensure larger scale impact. And I think really an opportunity for if we can get this right and work together, then this can play a really substantial part of climate action in the decade, this crucial decade ahead. So thank you all. Hopefully that's been an engaging session for you, the audience. Great panel. Thank you so much to each of you. Uh, and please enjoy the rest of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit uh, in the next couple of days.